The indie developers are attacking your nostalgia in full force this week, so hopefully you're in the mood for some late 90s platforming or early 90s arcade action. If YouTube analytics have told me anything, it seems they're barking up the right tree because this is Nindy Nation episode 154. Greetings, citizens! I'm Jeff, and today we've got 11 brand new indie games to check out, all of which are headed to the Nintendo eShop through August 7th. Tell me down in the comments, over on Twitter, or in the Nindy Nation Discord what you want to see more of, because this Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, we'll be checking out a couple of this week's releases live during our Nindies at Night stream. And now it's time, citizens, so click that like button, subscribe if you haven't, and before we check out the week's new releases, let's kick off episode 154 of Nindy Nation by taking a look at the four neglected Nindies that released since episode 153. The first game that dropped last week without a hint of fanfare is by a Colombian developer called R Next and publisher Gamera Games. Aniquilation is a twin-stick shooter that throws a lot of ideas at you and looks pretty fun. For 15 bucks, you get a twin-stick shooter mostly based on planets similar to Super Stardust, and it appears to be pretty focused on delivering a story as well. You can terraform planets, engage in base defense, play a bunch of modes in local co-op, and there's also a sword you can use for melee that sounds like it's got its whole own system of mechanics built in. Really seems like a lot of thought went into this game, and that it delivers quite a bit for 15 bucks. I'll check out reviews because it could be a good candidate for Nindies at Night. And then Rattleleka, usually Johnny on the spot with their Friday releases, slipped a day last week as they delivered Avenging Spirit by Shin Yudin for $4.79. It's actually an early 90s arcade game where you fight your way through traditional 2D stages, and then it throws in a possession mechanic to give it a bit of a unique flair. I'm assuming it's a pretty quick affair, but even so, I dig any opportunity to experience an otherwise forgotten game from the past. But I don't dig first-person psychological horror games, so when I saw Madison by Perpetual Europe for 35 bucks, I read the first sentence about waking up in a bathtub covered in blood before realizing your family was murdered and, yep, you guessed it, I noped right out of there. Red Deer Games released another entry in their Game Boy-inspired Bit Orchard series with Bit Orchard Animal Valley Extended Edition for $1.99. This one is all about top-down apple farming with a style right out of the pages of Pokemon Red and Blue with a focus on more active, arcade-like farming than something you'd see in, say, Stardew Valley. A few of you have told me recently that I've been too hard on Red Deer games, so I'm happy to say that their release this week looks like an all-around good time. But beyond those, all the rest are your typical shovelware garbage. So remember, if you see anything from any of these publishers, run fast and far, knowing full well that if they could, the following Nindy Nevers would absolutely try to kidnap your children. Boom hit Pixar's prison games, Trues! Naptime, Baltoro, and of course, the team who is loud and proud about cramming the eShop chock full of stolen assets and free iPhone games, cooking and publishing. Looking at the week ahead, it's, well, it's another slim week, citizens. But here at Nindy Nation, we're all about finding the good among the muck. So please, allow me to remove my jacket and lay it on the puddle of eShop nonsense as we head right in to the 11 new release Nindies hitting the Nintendo Switch through Sunday, August 7th. Weakfish Studio gets the ball rolling in August on the 1st with Phytro for $7.49. It's a 2D arcade fighter, but it looks more like a boxing game, and the description is all kinds of broken. I like the Kunio Kun inspiration, but I'm gonna have to see it in action, because pictures and broken English aren't doing the best job of selling it. But Paul Drummond does a great job of laying out the plot in his retro puzzle game, Kells. Think Lemmings, where your little dudes march on their own and you have to clear a path for them, but in this case, you do so by placing icons on the screen that change the direction of gravity. 
It looks pretty fun and has a demo available on Steam, but I'm a bit concerned its control scheme wouldn't translate well to the Switch. At only $5.99, though, I'm still interested in checking this one out. Only one game releases on Tuesday the 2nd, but I think it's most likely going to be our pick of the week. Mulgato's first title for the Switch is Frogun, and I can't wait to check this one out. We've talked on stream recently about how we're finally starting to see the next generation of indie developers release their first games. Whereas the last generation focused on games inspired by the 8 and 16-bit systems, and now we're seeing games inspired by the N64 and PlayStation era. First with games like A Hat in Time, Super Lucky's Tale, and the like, Frogun is clearly inspired by that generation's 3D mascot platformers. And with Frogun focusing its gameplay on a grappling hook mechanic, the comparisons to Chameleon Twist seem to be right on the money. The game is chock full of charm and looks to have a nice variety of platforming, puzzles, and boss fights scattered about its worlds with tons of secrets and collectibles to discover. All in all, I'm feeling really positive on Frogun, and with as much content as it appears to have, Top Hat Studio is pricing it just right at 15 bucks with a launch discount, bringing it down to $11.99. 11-Bit Studios is a publisher based in Poland who I am very fond of. They don't release a ton of games, but those that they do are of fantastic quality. Moonlighter, Frostpunk, This War of Mine, and one of my personal favorites, Children of Morta, all share similar vibes with tight gameplay, lots of replayability, and an emphasis on emotion and narrative. On Wednesday the 3rd, they team up with developer State of Play, no, not that State of Play, to release the big-budget, BAFTA-nominated South of the Circle for $11.69. It's an emotional narrative experience that blends all kinds of gameplay elements into a story that follows Peter, a Cambridge academic who crash lands in Cold War Antarctica. As you search for a way out, you'll be whisked into Peter's memories where you play out key moments across his life. You'll make choices, build relationships, and see everything through this beautiful, low-poly, rotoscoped animation style that really looks nice. The team has previously made games like Lumino City and are frequently among other artsy-fartsy developers whose work is praised by other BAFTA award winners and nominees. With an impressive cast of voice actors and motion capture to help deliver the story, I'll be watching the reviews for this one very closely. And speaking of emotional artsy-fartsy games, who better to kick off the releases on Thursday the 4th than Annapurna Interactive and Hindsight for $14.99? This also has a low-poly, down-to-earth vibe and seems like it's all about giving you the feels, but I'm otherwise struggling with what you actually do in this game. It's all about a woman who learns that the physical items around her are windows into her past memories, so there's a time control system of some sort at play, but beyond that, I don't see any display or interface to give a sense of what you actually do. It's developed by Joel McDonald, the creator of the well-received iOS game Prune, and seems like a great way to relive the trauma of your past, which sounds like fun? Seven Raven Studios is a developer-slash-publisher that I've always been rooting for. Their titles, games like Ghosts and Apples, Metalloid Origin, and this week's Afterwave Downfall, all seem like they came from a studio who was built to make mobile games, but are trying to... punch up, if you will. And frankly, I've enjoyed their lower budget, but well-polished releases. Afterwave seems to be on a similar course, too. It's an arcade vertical shooter with the twist that you're on a boat or jet ski or battleship of sorts, and you're racing down rivers while dodging bullets and battling enemies. In that way, it does a good job of standing out. The visuals look a bit grainy, but maybe it looks different in person, so I'll reserve judgment on that for later. But I do like the ability to upgrade your ships with the currency that you collect, as well as the slew of special attacks that you have at your disposal. At 12 bucks, it seems a bit steep, but if the gameplay is good, the upgrades are extensive, and the options for online co-op all pan out, I could see it justifying its price. And then on the flip side of the genre, Cubite is back in partnership with Pico Interactive as they seek to re-release classic forgotten titles onto modern consoles. And say what you will about the games themselves, I really respect this venture, and they've done a good job with everything I've tried thus far. 
Thunderbolt Collection is a vertical arcade space shooter that was previously unreleased in the West and included both an 8 and 16-bit version, though I'm not exactly sure which console they were originally released for. The package includes both versions, as well as a new English translation, and a few options for filtering and otherwise getting some more mileage out of these older games. It releases for $7.99, and if I happen to get a copy, I'll be sure to show it off for a minute or two at the start of this week's Nindies at Night. Okay, this last entry for Thursday is gonna take a bit of backstory, and I'm not entirely sure I've got all of the facts straight. So, as far as I can tell, Gotcha Gotcha Games, a terrible name if I do say so myself, is a studio created on the side from the company responsible for the RPG Maker series. They've only been around since September of 2020, so I think that Kokoro Clover Season 1 might be their first official release. Now, the game is built as if it were based on a Sunday morning anime series, but what they describe is something I'm super intrigued by. For 17 bucks, you basically get an 80s or 90s inspired series of an anime, complete with intros, credit scenes, animated cutscenes, and the like, but you play out a bunch of the plot through a 2D platformer with breaks for various minigames in between. The general vibe is like somewhere between Sailor Moon and Transformers, I think? <laughs> There's even commercial breaks to really drive home the illusion of a real anime series, which is super cool. On paper, it sounds really interesting, and the trailers show a bunch of content that looks like it took a lot of work to create. Of course, we don't know how the final product will turn out, but I hope it's good, because this concept could be really fun to explore. Before we wrap up the week with three games on Friday the 5th, here's a few to watch out for as you tiptoe through the hallway of broken glass that is the Nintendo eShop. Fiki Spotter, Megapolis, is one of the most blatant find-the-thing-on-the-screen mobile titles we've yet to see from Ultimate Games, proving that they're really, unfortunately, headed in the wrong direction as a publisher. And last week, Regista told us that they had the last entry in their Japanese escape game series, but they lied, because now we have to deal with the retro house. We also get our first release by Software Scribes, which seems like a shame, and I'm not sure if they fully grasp how symbols work, because I doubt they meant to name this thing 90 Inch Soccer, but that's what they called it. And I can't tell if the company name The Binary Family is a troll or not, but their games like Pure Crosswords, the best crossword puzzle word game ever, certainly is. Thankfully, we round out the week with three games that all show some promise. Well, keyword on some. The first release is by Accelerate Games in tandem with Signal Studios and is a port of the 2010 Xbox Live arcade game Toy Soldiers HD. It's a real-time strategy slash tower defense where you can jump into the planes, tanks, and boots on the ground to manage the action as a commander or directly as one of the soldiers themselves. It was well received on the Xbox, but that was 12 years ago, and I don't know, you guys. I think this game is ugly. Like, really ugly. I can't tell if it's one of those port the PC version to Switch and just murder the resolution or not, because even the Xbox trailers I found just look really grainy. It's like an HD version of the early PS2 games, which coined the phrase Jaggies. The game itself looks fun, I'll give it that but with its visuals and a $30 price tag, I'll be waiting for reviews. East Asia Soft's release for the week is a 2D action platformer with a great art style and an M rating. Let's see, Sophia and the Ancient Clan is $7.99 and looks like a traditional entry in the genre. It's colorful, you've got magic, some puzzles, why does it have an M rating? Hmm, blood, violence, strong language, oh, there it is. Sexual content and nudity, apparently. So I guess this cute little witch gets naked? Either way, I like what they're doing here and would like to see more. Can never go wrong with a weekend platformer, in my opinion. Unless it's too pervy, but, you know, never mind. And last up for this week is Rataleka rounding out things with a top-down puzzler called Roll the Cat for $4.99. As the name suggests, your job is to roll the cats back into bed, which is done via a traditional sliding block puzzle format. I guess you'd take something tried and true, throw cats in it, and hope for the best? 
It's developed by Lejeune Art and brings with it a super chill vibe. And that's it, my friends. 11 new releases this week, with Frogun being my clear winner and Afterwave certainly piquing my curiosity. If you're looking for them feels, you've got South of the Circle in hindsight, but what's jumping out to you? Tell me down in the comments, over on Twitter, or head over to our Discord and join the discussion. As usual, we'll be playing a couple of these games this Thursday on Nindies at Night, so if you're dying to see more, be sure to tell me which ones and I'll see what I can do. Next week, we've got three highly anticipated releases, including Arcade Paradise and Cult of the Lamb, so be sure to come back next Wednesday for episode 155. In the meantime, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe if you haven't, and share Nindy Nation with your friends who, uh, need a little more indie in their life. Until next week, I'm Jeff, this has been Nindy Nation episode 154, and remember, no matter what type of game you're looking for, Nindy Nation will be right here to help you find just the thing to keep your Joy-Cons synced.